Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maite Morales, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator of Casa Cuba at FIU. I would like to thank you for joining us today for Contemporary, a series of virtual conversations that highlight the influence of Cuban art presented by FIU Miami Beach Urban Studios and Casa Cuba. Before we begin, I would like to tell you about Casa Cuba, a very special project of FIU. Casa Cuba is bringing together scholars, artists, policymakers, business leaders, students, and the community at large to build a leading cultural center and think tank for the discussion and study of Cuban affairs and the preservation and celebration of the Cuban heritage. This will be our Cuban home away from home, a home for Cubans, but also for everyone else who is curious and passionate about Cuba and the Cuban community. Casa Cuba has attracted influential board members, secured a prominent site on the FIU campus for its state-of-the-art facility, and received significant philanthropic support, including prestigious grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Knight Foundation. Our facility will feature galleries for interactive exhibitions, classrooms, where faculty will teach more than 70 courses on Cuba currently offered at FIU, and a venue for events, artistic performances, and dynamic programming, such as the Contemporary Series. Contemporary is just a taste of what you will experience at Casa Cuba. This initiative is envisioned as a series of intimate conversations featuring leading Cuban voices from the art industry, including artists, gallerists, curators, and other visionaries. The conversations are recorded and preserved for posterity as part of Casa Cuba's oral history collection and will inspire us to reflect on the profound intersections between art and the Cuban identity. We are delighted to be joined by Director of Curatorial Affairs and Chief Curator at Perez Art Museum Miami and fellow Cuban, Rene Morales, as our special guest this evening. Thank you, Rene. I would like to also thank our FIU alumna and independent curator, Daniel Damas, for moderating the series and thank our friends at CARTA, the Miami Beach Urban Studios, and our Casa Cuba team for all the hard work behind the scenes to coordinate the program. And thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you at future events, and I encourage you to get involved in the historic effort to build Casa Cuba at FIU. There are many ways to support the project and become a founder. We need your help to make this dream a reality. Thank you. Gracias. Maite, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I am so grateful and excited to present our third guest speaker of Contemporary, Renee Morales, Director of Curial Affairs and Chief Curator at Perez Art Museum, Miami. Renee has organized over 50 exhibitions at PAM, some of which he will share with us tonight. A few of these exhibitions include artists such as Crystal, Dar Friedman, Sarah Oppenheimer, Margetica Kotrick, and Amelia Pelaez. Morales is currently working on a major career survey of the work of Gary Simmons and has spearheaded numerous major acquisitions for Pam's permanent collection. This includes a set of nearly 400 works from the Sackner Archive of Concrete and Visual Poetry, as well as over 50 works purchased from Pam's Collectors Council. Prior to joining Pam, formerly Miami Art Museum, uh, Morales worked at the Museum of Art uh, Rhode Island School of Design, where he co-organized Island Nations, new art from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. Morales, who grew up in Miami, received his BA from Swarthmore College and his MA in Art History from Brown University. Renee, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you must have had you must have a very packed plate these days, um, and we are all very excited to have you joining us tonight. I think I speak for all of us tuning in that we are lucky to have a beautiful museum like Pam in our city and are even luckier to have a great educator and leader like yourself sourcing the type of art that speaks to the community. Um, thank you, so. Danielle. Thank you. Very, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So I know you have prepared a slideshow um, for our conversation tonight and I'm personally very excited uh, to get started and talk about your personal career journey and curatorial interests. But I'd also like to invite anyone part um, tuning in tonight, if you have any additional questions that we might not cover, um, please feel free to send them um, to, to us through the Q&A. Um, I'll try my best <laughs> to get through all of them, but sometimes time does run out. 
So uh, for anything that we don't get to, to tonight, I'm more than happy to answer them in a separate email later on. So with that, why don't we pull up the PowerPoint and um, kind of get started at the beginning. Okay, so how, how did you first begin in the art world? Like what, um, what made you uh, feel attracted to this kind of career path? And what were you first, you know, looking towards at the beginning? Um, well, um, you know, I had always loved art. Um, I grew up here in Miami and I grew up going to the CFA, the predecessor institution for Miami Art Museum and eventually Paris Art Museum Miami. And um, yeah, I'd always just sort of been naturally drawn to it. I have, I have just like so many ways of answering this question of how, how I came in, but um, one of those uh, involves uh, my sort of academic experience. I was studying at, at, at Swarthmore, I was studying um, cognitive science with a concentration specifically on visual perception. And um, I was just really always fascinated with the connection between the eye and the brain and the mind, uh, all sort of different uh, things that work together to help us see. And um, along the way, I kept coming across these really interesting texts that were really more coming from the direction of um, art theory. Uh, and I ended up just really diving into that. Uh, after college, I got a job at a lab and realized I did not love working in labs. Um, uh, just personally, and um, I decided to go into grad school uh, for that, uh, to, to pursue my, um, my sort of my second major. I had majored in uh, psychobiology with uh, visual perception as a focus um, and double majored in art history, uh, never really thinking that I was going to go down that route, but then I totally did. <laughs> wow, that's, that's actually really funny you mentioned that because I, I had a similar um, undergrad experience. I Double, I dual degreed in psychology and studio art, not thinking that I would go towards art, but it's just that calling, like, I, I guess it's something that you can't really deny. You have to go towards it. It's yeah. just such a, 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 an important part of our existence. So yeah. um, we finally got the slide up. I know okay, uh, right. we have here um, a piece by Keith Gannon. Well, the slide is. Uh, uh, do you I want think, to speak a little bit about it? Sure. Yeah, I think this is a very. It comes at a good moment. This slide. Um, I was just talking about how I, um, uh, you know, that summer after um, undergraduate, I decided to apply for grad school. I ended up going to uh, Brown University, really thinking that I would pursue uh, a straight art history, more academic track, um, and then at some point, uh, Brown allowed me to rather than being a, being a TA, they allowed me to serve as a uh, research assistant at the RISD Museum, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum just down the hill, uh, which um, is one of those things that uh, at the time that, you know, I didn't realize how significant an effect that would have on my life, uh, but it was really game changing. Um, I just really poured myself completely in the work that I did uh, for the RISD Museum and um, you know, I was just very lucky. In the end, by the time I left grad school, I had already organized several exhibitions um, and I had that experience uh, to, to take with me into my professional life. So in that sense, I was just absolutely lucky. Um, I was um, possibly most lucky in the sense that once I started doing that kind of curatorial work, just from the very beginning, I knew right away that this is exactly what I wanted to do. And then in fact, um, this might be the only thing that I could do, the only thing that, that, that I would really feel happy doing. So I was very lucky to have had that kind of clarity uh, early enough in my career that I was able to build, build upon it. And, you know, I did several shows for RISD, as I mentioned, uh, culminating in this exhibition, which was, you know, really deeply meaningful for me called Island Nations, New York from Cuba, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, which um, for starters, uh, prompted me or through this project, I ended up traveling to these places. I hadn't been back to Cuba since I was a child. I was born in Cuba, but uh, I grew up here in Miami. And um, that, I haven't been back since then, but that was a, a really kind of life-changing experience. And um, just getting to know the artists down there and seeing 
um, their lives and their work uh, and, and becoming closely acquainted with people like Kiskeya, um, who's still a good friend, uh, was, was just super impactful for me and just an amazing way to sort of start my career. Um, this is all thanks to Judith Tannenbaum, with whom I uh, co-curated the exhibition. It was really a, an important mentor for me. She was the curator at RISD at the time, curator of contemporary art. I personally love this piece by Kiskea because it's it's um, it's interesting that you study perception, and it, it it obviously reflects in your curatorial decisions because this is a uh, it's almost documentation. It's documentation of a performance that she did where um, it was this sensory experience for people that were taking this ice cream that was supposed to be salt water, correct? That's right, yeah, it's ice cream made out of um, salt water from the Caribbean Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's also, it's a photograph, but it's also a performance. And um, that was really cool being able to, to uh, uh, not a performance so much as uh, that you, um, what you do is when you present this work, you, uh, work with an ice cream maker or you produce the ice cream and you have that ice cream available in your in your exhibition space. We were able to do that both in Providence and uh, here in Miami Art Museum when we took on Kiskea's uh, solo show a few years later. So what necessarily um, brought you back to Miami? Uh, well, you know, I had been in Providence for almost nine years at that point. That's a long time to be in Providence. And I love Providence. It's just, it will always have a special place in my heart. But, um, you know, uh, Miami just has a very, very strong gravitational pull. And actually I actually have a better answer to all of this. So um, <laughs> over the years that I was in grad school in particular, and even going back in undergrad, you know, obviously I would come home uh, over uh, Christmas and um, uh, sometimes Thanksgiving in the summers. Uh, I, I, I had like no money, so I was taking the Amtrak all the way from Providence, first Philly, and then from Providence all the way down to Miami. I can tell you how many times I took the train or the bus uh, all the way up and down the Eastern Seaboard. Um, but anywho, every time I would come down, I would notice that there was a lot of energy brewing down here uh, artistically. Um, you know, I grew up here feeling rather, um, you know, hungry, starved, uh, in fact, for um, artistic experiences and cultural experiences, um, which at the time uh, when I was in high school, I didn't really, I, I thought that there, it wasn't happening much, that there wasn't much uh, to offer. Um, in retrospect, uh, it, it's so obvious to me that there was a lot going on. It was just, I, it was just that I wasn't in a position to perceive it. I didn't, I didn't know uh, what was happening. But as I started getting older and during these visits, I started noticing that, you know, there was this incredible energy uh, and this dynamism brewing, this great art community that was just growing and becoming much more uh, robust. And at one point, I just realized that I wanted to come home and be a part of that. I wanted to to contribute, um, to kind of get into the on the get in get in on the ground floor of that, um, and and to help build it. Uh, so um, that was a big part of it. And I just cold called the uh, Miami Art Museum. Uh, Peter Boswell, uh, another very important mentor for me, was super just incredibly generous and um, uh, and and open uh, to me. Um, that uh, you know, I will always uh, be very grateful for the role he played in helping me come back home. Has anyone been here ever, since then? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Has anyone ever cold called you at the fam? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, a few times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so yeah, I moved back down, and um, the first uh, significant project that I did, um, which uh, I co-organized with Lori Mertes, who's now the director at Locust Projects here in town, uh, was the show called Miami in Transition, which was essentially about the real estate boom. Uh, you know, I, when I moved back down, Miami was in this, I mean, this feels like almost ancient history at this point, but uh, Miami was in this very, very intense growth phase uh, with a lot of change happening. Uh, a lot of buildings being torn down and replaced. Uh, just, just, I mean, it was just an incredibly dynamic situation before it all kind of came to a, a, a you know, screeching halt in, uh, w with the, the uh, financial crisis. 
And uh, the show was about understanding, trying to understand those changes uh, through the eyes of artists. And it gave me an opportunity to um, just very quickly uh, get to know our community of artists, uh, which is just, uh, again, incredibly dynamic and um, uh, diverse and, and just great bun bunch. Um, I mean, wherever I end up as a curator, I will always want to have a strong artist community uh, to work with. It just, um, it's, it's such a source of energy and such a source of uh, inspiration for 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 me as a curator that um, uh, yeah it just it just means a lot so this show was uh, you know not a huge show but it really um, uh, really was very impactful and opened a lot of doors for me literally I mean it's interesting because this happened like you said right before the financial crisis of 2008 but it is still something that seems prominent now like it it picks up again right. So yeah. Yeah. I guess something you mentioned um, working with artists and, and how important it is to, to bringing these shows together, because what would any of it be without the artists? Um, what have you, what have you noticed is the most, um, most helpful thing that you can bring to an artist? Um. You know, I'm not sure. I think that's a good question for an artist. I think um, some of the uh, most, or I think I would say all of the most significant shows that I've done have been, or meaningful for me personally, have been because of, have been meaningful because of the relationship that mm -hmm. uh, I've developed with the artists uh, with whom I'm wor I've worked. Um, that relationship in and of itself for me has been just so uh, productive. Um, even, you know, many years after uh, the project is over. Um, so I guess I ho my hope is to some extent I might have um, helped, uh, I might have had that somewhat of that effect also on some of the artists I've worked with. And um, it's really just a, um, kind of like any relationship that opens your mind a bit. Um, it's, it can uh, just be the most, uh, the most productive thing for you. Uh, just to have someone kind of change your perspective a bit. Um, right. So, yeah. And then we have uh, fun. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the slideshow is a little bit of, um, so I hate talking about myself. Um, I figured uh, a good way to, to do this might be to sort of let the work speak for me and to sort of present a little bit of, a, of an autobiography in the form of, of installation shots. Um, and, uh, you know, I should mention I've done, you know, I think something like uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 exhibitions for uh, my current museum, Miami Art Museum slash Paris Art Museum Miami. So this is just a small selection and I love all the shows equally. Um, I have to put out that caveat. But this show I thought was, um, you know, again, not a huge show, but it was quite ambitious logistically and it kind of um, really indicates one of the several many, many directions that I, I've, I've pursued as a curator just instinctually. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, as you're doing it, uh, you don't really know that you are, in fact, following these kind of routes, these concentrations, or that was the case for me. Only looking backward, am I able to sort of uh, identify a few uh, avenues that uh, have become, been kind of recurring themes for me. Um, and one of them, as we mentioned uh, before, I think it has a lot to do with my background in perception studies, um, is just all about the experience of the, the eye, the body, and the space. And that's what this show was about. It was about artworks that engage, uh, literally engage the floors, the walls, the ceilings of the exhibition space and the viewer, the viewer's body. Um, basically like this kind of like phenomenological approach to art um, and um, yeah, these were pretty significant projects. That's Katarina Grossa in the background there where we brought in this like huge amount of dirt uh, which she then spray painted. Um, she was dressed up, she looked like a Martian with a, with a ray gun like spraying this, this whole space. And I thought it was just really beautiful like just painting in space. 
Um, and then in the foreground there, that's a big, um, that's a piece by Charles Ray called Inkbox, which is a steel cube that's polished and black on the outside, but it's empty on the top. It's, uh, it's an open cube, empty on the top. And you, we filled it with uh, something like 2,500 pounds of black, black printer's ink. Um, and it was just kind of amazing. You level the piece as you're filling it. And if you get it just right, like if it's, if it's even a little off, it doesn't work. But if you get it just, just right, perfectly, perfectly level, it kind of transforms right in front of your eyes from an, an open steel cube filled with ink with what you could swear just looks like a closed, polished cube. Like, um, I swear, you could stand in front of it and someone will tell you that's ink on the surface and you'll be like, no way, I don't believe it, you know? And then that in itself kind of prompts this temptation to touch it, right? But if you touch it, then it like kind of punishes you, right? Yeah. So it, it has this like kind of recharge relationship again between the viewer's body and the object in the space um, that, that I love. So this is, um, you know, uh, I think in my career, I haven't shied away from logistically uh, difficult projects. Um, I've kind of taken a certain um, almost uh, perverse relish in um, those kinds of projects. Although after um, having done a few, you really start to really respect them. <laughs> you know, you really start to respect logistical complications and um, understand that uh, some of your choices can really affect a lot of people. Um, and, and you, you want to be careful, um, you know, be courageous about it, but uh, really be as careful as possible. Anyway. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Some yeah. of my favorite projects too have been these these projects that I thought that I couldn't do. Like I yeah. thought that they were just too much of a of a mountain. And when they're finished, you you look back and you're you're thinking, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, doing these kinds of projects just gives you so much respect for uh, prep crews and registrars and um, the folks who. Um, make those kinds of logistically challenging things happen, uh, sometimes just unbelievably uh, complex uh, challenges. Um, there's, so, so yeah. many hands, there's so many hands behind the scenes that make these playgrounds. I, it, it's interesting, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of these um, curatorial decisions that you make, I, I just keep going back to perception, but it's just the second you said that you studied, it makes so much sense to me that you you choose some of these, these um, topics because you are ex bringing this whole other kind of world and challenging what is perception, what we feel, how we are. And to have such an experience, it does create such a, it's created with such a collective. And I, I, see, I see what you're saying about, you know, respecting all of the hands that go into it because it is hard work. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, I know that you had mentioned that, that that show was near and dear to you. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about um, tr the transition from uh, the Miami Art Museum to the Perez Art Museum? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it was, um, I, I, it was just a, a total roller coaster ride. I, it was a, it's, it's an experience I'll never forget, and um, I, I just treasure the memories of that transition. Um, I mean, I'll mention it was very much a part of my job from the beginning. Um, I guess I started at Miami Art Museum in what was it, 2005, and um, it wasn't very long after that that I attended a groundbreaking ceremony uh, at the at the site. Um, it would take another, you know, what is it, eight years uh, before we actually built the building because, of course, the financial crisis got in the way, um, among other things. But so it was a really long journey. But um, I think uh, from day one, part of the idea was really to uh, become be part of this uh, project to build this uh, to build this building, to prepare this building. And I just feel unbelievably humbled and honored to have been uh, part of that and to have helped contribute. Um, in my really small way. I'm not just being falsely humbled. There was just so many people um, involved in this massive effort, including the voters of um, Dade County um, that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstate my, my role, but nevertheless, I, it's something that I feel a great deal of pride about uh, because 
you know, I think maybe uh, I can imagine being a curator um, at another museum somewhere. Um, you just have a very different relationship. For me, working here as a curator has always, I've always had a sense that like the work I do, of course, it's for my family. It's for me. It's for my career. It's for the public. But it's also on some level, it feels like um, this is very much uh, work that I'm doing for my hometown, for my people, you know. Um, I've curated shows, the Amelia Palaz show that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, uh, my main audience for that was like my mom and my aunt, you know what I mean? Like it just uh, it, having that kind of personal collect connection really has colored my experience here um, in a good way. And you did mention that you started uh when you when you broke ground or when you started at the PIM, you had to start with three shows at once. Was that always the plan, or was it cut? Was it was something yeah. just added on, or? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, well, you know, there were three curators uh, at, who, uh, and um, fifteen separate spaces, uh, nine exhibitions. So um, we divvied up the the work, and yes, I had three shows uh, to do at once. Um, and uh, one of them was this show here, a human document, selections from the Sackner Archive of Concrete and Visual Poetry, which is uh, that, that, that archive is a collection here in town, uh, the collection of Ruth and Marvin Sackner, uh, which deals with the merger of word and image. Uh, this was a, you know, not a huge show in terms of square footage, but a huge show in terms of content. It was, uh, I think, something like 180 objects in this, uh, in, the, in this show and the scope is just was just mind boggling. It went everywhere from like, you know, a book by Stefan Mallarmé from uh, 1898, all the way through all the isms, Italian futurism, Dadaism, um, surrealism, Bauhaus, uh, all the way up to situationism and then into much more contemporary work up until just like um, more recent work. Again, dealing with this merger of word and image um, and uh, so that was just a big scope, uh, sort of intellectually, to try to encompass. Like, oh, there was just a tremendous amount of research to kind of be able to uh, try to do uh, justice to such a varied and such a large kind of landscape of artistic creativity. Um, so, yeah, I really, this was a show that I loved. And, you know, uh, eventually we acquired um, everything in this exhibition plus more and total was something like 325 objects that we acquired um, depending on how you count it could be more or less uh, if you count the portfolios it could be like hundreds more um, and uh, yeah that too was really graduate really gratifying to be able to bring that into the collection and I'm just always deeply um, grateful to the Knight Foundation and to the Sackners for making it happen and Dennis Scholl who helped uh, spearhead the whole uh, process. It's really interesting, I mean, just from this photo, how dynamic you made um, such an extensive co uh, collection of works um, come to life in the space, because oftentimes you see, you know, a show that has so many works in it and it's it's just on a table, or, I mean, I see even the vitrines were given a lot of thought um, yeah. with, with that special design. It's It's really um, addressing how you think of, of space in, in, yeah. in your work. Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I organized the show is I went over the, Sa the Sackners are just incredibly generous um, with their time and, and with their space. Uh, I was at their place uh, once a week um, for almost a year, uh, one day a week for, for about a year. And, you know, I would look at these materials and most of the time I would be holding them up, you know, it's like you're holding up a book, right? And when you do so, you're looking at it at an angle, right? So that, that was kind of important to me. That was a part of the, the, the inspiration for those vitrines, to try as much as possible to mimic that kind of very intimate experience that you have with those kinds of materials, as opposed to like a painting on the wall, which always, there's always a, a bit of a remove, right? Um, so anyway, um, it's just, uh, I guess, you know, uh, curating when um, it's done thoughtfully, uh, it, it, curating is best when it's done thoughtfully, when even like the most mundane, mundane details, uh, like the, the, the design of the vitrines, um, uh, works with the material, with the art, um, not, that it's not just sort of secondary to it or, or, or um, you know, extraneous. Right. I do have a question here from one of our attendees. Um, 
they ask, well, what is Pam doing to stay connected to the community during this time? And well, when will it be open to the public? Okay, great. Yeah, well, we are looking to reopen soon in the next few weeks. We haven't uh, announced a, a reopening date. Um, we kind of delayed our reopening when we, you know, things were looking really bad. We had this big surge starting in June. Things are better now. Um, but we, we haven't announced the date yet, but that, that'll be coming very soon. Um, and as far as staying connected with the community, um, I think, uh, you know, immediately back in March, we went into high gear in terms of our programming and, and adapting to becoming a, a virtual museum. Um, so, for example, the education department for years had done this program called Local Views, uh, which involved inviting local artists, uh, Miami-based artists, to come to the museum and essentially give tours of the collection. Um, immediately that transitioned into, instead of monthly events, uh, weekly uh, events. So check it out. Every Thursday we've been doing programs with local artists um, that are you know, really intimate because they're working from home and uh, sort of talking to you from their computers. Um, so in a way there's like a greater amount of intimacy to that format than there is when you're like in a crowd of 30 people huddled around um, this person giving a, a guide. Um, pretty soon, actually Thursday, we're going to roll, we're supplementing that local views program with a series of online studio visits uh, that are conversations between uh, the curatorial staff and uh, local artists. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's been mainly through these uh, this this very I think robust uh, uh, virtual programming that we have been trying to um, stay. Uh, stay connected to everyone. Um, yeah. I have one more question uh, from an audience member. Um, could you tell us more about the curatorial process and how artists are selected to be part of the, coll the collection? But I'd also, um, I'm also personally curious, how are you selecting the local artists for the um, local views or the studio visits? Well, like everything, I think we work very collaborative, collaboratively at PAM, and uh, I think those decisions always come through conversations, uh, long, long, many, many long conversations among the staff, um, the curatorial staff and the uh, education staff as well, which does just an amazing job, I think. Um, at, and um, yeah, as far as how decisions may are made um, and the curatorial process and uh, things like that. Uh, for me, it's just all about research. It starts, starts with uh, kind of obsessive research into um, the things that I, I, I gravitate to, a couple of which we've, we've talked about. Uh, I'm very fascinated in Miami itself as a subject and as a source of inspiration. I'm interested in issues of perception. We'll go into a few other themes as we run through the, the slideshow. Um, but um, it, it all starts with research and most often, usually for me, um, those kinds of decisions arise after years of uh, becoming acquainted with an artist's work and watching that artist develop over the course of years. Uh, so, yeah, um, you know, whether it's a choice to do an exhibition or to acquire work for the collection, uh, it, it, it often arises from a very extended uh, relationship, um, whether it's a, a personal direct relationship or it's a, or, or it's a relationship via the research, uh, just which is more to, often the case. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to mention how you place such emphasis on the relationship between the artist and yourself. And, and that does take a, a number of years, I feel, to really understand a person and their process or anything about them, so. Yeah. Um, that is very interesting. Um, uh, I want to put a I wanted to put a plug a little bit earlier when we had that that figure sort of standing in front of the centrist sign that sculpture that was by George Sanchez Calderon and the reason this is a bit of a stream of consciousness um, representation here but he is a uh, an FIU alum and we'll get to another FIU alum so uh, I wanted to just kind of give a shout out to FIU you uh, you guys have uh, created some really great uh, cultural producers here in town. Anyway. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> it's definitely great. 
this is another uh, in the upper left. This is another show that uh, was one of those three shows that I, I organized for the inauguration of the of the um, of the museum in 2013. Um, this is a show of uh, the work of Melia Pelaez, and um, yeah, this this I think points in the direction of another kind of category or um, avenue that I've often taken in my curatorial career, which for lack of a better term, I often refer to mentally to myself as a kind of a material culture approach, one that kind of levels the hierarchies between artwork and regular objects. I mean, to some extent, I think that, you know, you can get as much, um, you can get a lot of information out of this uh, uh, um, bottle of uh, Tylenol and its design as you can from an artwork. Um, and um, when you think about artworks as real objects inhabiting the world and having their own history or their own provenance, their own um, kind of journey through the, the, the physical world, um, you can draw a lot out of it. Um, and in the case of the Palaz show, for example, as you can see, I incorporated, um, well, this one I, I co-organized with Ingrid Elliott. Um, I incorporated uh, real furniture and tablecloths uh, from the era and um, drew connections between those and uh, the subject matter of her paintings. Um, the theme, the, the idea behind the show was that, you know, people have talked a lot, I'll always kind of automatically talk about Palaz's work with respect to Cuban architecture, right? The vitrales and the arches and um, columns and things like that. But um, I wanted to expand that just a little bit um, to, and to, to just point out that really what she seemed to be focused on was craft um, and artisanship, the, the mark of the hand. Um, and this was an interesting moment in Cuba in the 20s and 30s and 40s in sort of her heyday as a, in her artistic development. Um, when a lot of those traditional handicrafts were being replaced. Uh, you know, Cuba modernized very, very quickly, uh, very, very uh, intensely in the 20s and 30s, mainly in the 20s and 30s, right? Um, so uh, to me, there's this, there's always been this element to her work that has been almost a, um, well, just a really fascinating irony where on one hand, she's embracing the most current contemporary modernist visual language to express these rather old uh, kinds of objects. So, um, it, it, you know, that, that again, came very much out of this uh, kind of material ap culture approach, which by the way, is very much the influence of my, my wife, who is a, a design historian um, and, um, uh, yeah, that, that has been another very productive kind of form of thinking for me in my work. Did she help you source some of this furniture? Not to source it so much, but she knew all about it and gave me a lot of uh, perspective on everything, as she always does. <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. When you, when you thought of merging those, those two together, the, the, the subjects that she's, she's painting or, or the, the furniture, juxtapose against the painting. Where do you, where do you, did you see or did you feel during that process of incorporating this that maybe it was more of like a gesture you wanted to, to, to show or did you want people to feel like they were actually stepping into an environment? Like where, where do you see yourself having to stop and go in those aspects? Like when it's too far, when it's too kitschy or maybe this is yeah. just, you know, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Um, yeah, you, I, I tend to shy away from an actual like theatricality. You know, it's still very much about, uh, you know, uh, uh, observing these objects and um, thinking about them. Uh, uh, you know, presenting in a way that is conducive to deep thought about these objects, um, as opposed to. Uh, you know, necessarily like a more kind of escapist uh, approach. So I don't know. Um, and, you know, I think this show, like, um, I'll give you one example. There was a, a self-portrait of Amelia sitting in, the, in that same wicker chair, that Haywood Wakefield chair, chair that was in the center there. And then right next to it, there was a vitrine with an archival photograph um, from the Cuban Heritage Collection at UM of Amelia sitting in that chair. So those kinds of connections between the objects and the paintings and the archival material, uh, I think is just really kind of 
interesting to me and I, I hope that it helps sort of stimulate the visitor and sort of um, bring the artwork and the period alive in one's mind, but without necessarily like recreating it. And like the idea is not to do a simulacra, um, but anyway, yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question here. Um, how exactly does an artist approach a curator in order to begin to develop this relationship that we were speaking of? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, uh, I mean, I think this is Miami, you know, this isn't MoMA. I think we're much more approachable here. Uh, and we welcome uh, folks uh, contacting us and letting us know. Um, there is a, uh, uh, an email curatorial at pam.org uh, that um, we are, that, that can be used and, or you can contact the museum at the visitor services desk and um, they're always happy to to uh, pass along uh, materials or anything. Um, and then the other thing is just that, you know, for, uh, I don't know if this question is coming from a, a, an artist, but, um, you know, something that's really important for both artists and curators is just be out there, right? Um, uh, this is a bit of a moot point right now uh, because of COVID and um, social, you know, the, the, all the, the obstacles to socializing, although people are starting to uh, do things again. Um, but it's just um, uh, a, an important way of sort of getting to the curator is by integrating yourself into the community, going into, go out to openings, go out to, uh, you know, get to know the community. And um, often it's through those relationships within the community, not necessarily with curators, but just with other artists, uh, other gallery, you know, galleries and stuff that you end up getting to know the curators. So I think that's, that's probably the most natural way to do it. You know, just have to be in the scene, uh, and and you know, again, it's in other places. There is this kind of. There are a lot of um, real and psychological obstacles um, to that kind of uh, you know integration, but Miami still is young and small and um, or, or medium sized, let's say, and. Um, uh, it's uh, it, people are a lot more accessible than in other places. So you know, get out there. Um, <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, I don't know how we're doing on time. But let me just race through. This was another project that I thought was really uh, meaningful for me. Maria Tica Potrich, who's a Slovenian artist, who did this project called the School of the Forest, where we. Um, this came from her travels in Brazil. She was invited by the. Universidade de Floresta, uh, which is a sort of a satellite of, or was a satellite of the University of Sao Paulo, to go out to the Amazon and to do a residency out there. So this uh, school of the forest in Sao Paulo uh, would invite prominent artists and philosophers to go to Accra, really a very remote area deep in the Amazon, to have um, not just teach, but to learn from uh, the people of the forest, right? Whether they were indigenous people or loggers or miners, whoever. Uh, and often those interactions would take place in structures that look very much like this. So we, she, her idea was to recreate this and then to kind of recreate her experience with this program. Uh, so we then invited numerous people who had participated in the original school of the forest in the middle of, of the Amazon in uh, Sao Paulo and in, in, in Brazil. Uh, to come to Miami and to hold these workshops and do these lectures at PAM. So this was just uh, often with a, a revolving around the theme of the relationship between ind indigenous people and their knowledge and uh, how their perspective can help us cope with climate change and climate crisis and um, things like that. So it was just, it was a beautiful, um, I, there, I just have so such very fond memories of, of these kind of beautiful interactions that happen in this very intimate space. I have a first um, uh, fond mem memory there because uh, during Cannonball, when Cannonball was still a thing, yeah. program, the research art dialogue program, that we did have a pretty interesting um, discussion under the pavilion. And it was this wonderful experience just being in a, in a museum, but also speaking about, about the world. And um, I think the topic then was art in the Anthropocene, which is since humans have come into existence in the earth and their effect on the world. And I 
believe we were speaking of um, rising tides at the time, but yeah. it was, this was a beautiful project, especially to, to come together with other people to speak about things that we were all concerned about in the community. Right. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I would say, you know, this project sums up uh, a few uh, of these, again, sort of, sort of special interests that looking backward, I can identify in my curatorial work, including um, the, uh, well, including ecological issues. That's a theme that I've also pursued with uh, artists and uh, several projects. Um, you know, there was this other project where we, we recreated an aviary for parrots in a gallery that was just oh, wild and again had this sort of undercurrent um, having to do with uh, climate change and ecology. Um, but also, you know, the thing about this project is that, um, you know, you walk into the gallery and you see humans, you know, instead of seeing these just just these inanimate objects, you see actual humans interacting. Um, it's this, it's the technical term for this is relational art, right? Where um, the artwork is, um, the art object is de-emphasized and the interactions that you might have with other humans within the space is, is, is emphasized. Um, and that's, that's another sort of idea or genre that I've um, often been interested in. Um, I do have a question here from one of our audience members, how can organizations partner with the PAM? So I guess I mentioned, you know, Cannonball partnered with you back then. Um, perhaps, um, how, how, would, how would an organization approach the PAM? I guess. Yeah. You know, okay. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on the organization, but, um, uh, you know, what, what, what type of organization they are, but, uh, you know, like I said, the PAM is, um, it might seem, I don't, I don't, I have no perspective, but it might seem like this kind of lofty place, but, you know, with like um, a, a sort of a secret army of people working behind uh, these walls. But in fact, it's a very family-like um, atmosphere. And I like to think that we are approachable. So, um, uh, you know, you can always reach out to us. Our education staff is also very much out there. Um, and, um, and, and building these relationships, uh, not just with individuals, but with organizations. Um, and I don't know, I guess just uh, shoot us a note. <laughs> that's, that's the best way. Come to our openings and um, introduce yourself. Don't be shy. No. Mm -hmm. Great response. <laughs> mm -hmm. so here we have Victoria Gitman. Oh, yeah. So, um, well, this was also really a, another one of those projects that are just so meaningful to me because of the relationship with the per, with, with the with the uh, artist that that arose from it. Um, I think Victoria is amazing. She, this is a local um, an artist who lives uh, in, in Miami in Hallandale specifically, who was originally from Argentina. Um, and who is also an FIU alum, which is another reason why I wanted to talk about this. Um, She's a painter, so you know you'd walk into this space and it looked almost empty, right? Uh, with these tiny little paintings along the wall, but then you would look up close and that's painting on the right um, the, of an ocelot fur purse. Um, go, to, go to the next slide, please. Uh, that's her painting. That's the purse at the left uh, set up on a table and that's uh, the painting on the easel there just to show you just how incredibly, um, you know, realistic her, her work is just how incredibly skilled she is. Um, if you want to go to the next one, um, yeah, this, this is her. Her head appears in every single one of those. Her reflection appears in every single one of those little pearls. It's just unbelievable. And on the right, um, that's actually a painting of a drawing. So she taught herself how to mimic the effect of graphite on paper using. Uh, brush, uh, you know, that's a very dry medium, but using a very wet medium of uh, oil uh, and brush on, on panel. Uh, so this was just like, I mean, the challenge level of that is just off the charts and the skill level is not just off the charts. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to point this out, uh, like I'm, it's my, my loves are not just uh, sort of dry kind of con conceptual art. I do, uh, which, which this has a tremendous amount of concept and and thought behind it. I mean, an, an incredible amount of um, sort of content here. But at the same time, you know, there's, I, I love beauty. I love beauty as much as anyone. I love a beautiful painting. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've always tried to be balanced in that, in that way. 
And then um, this is a project with um, an artist named Sarah Oppenheimer that involved these two glass elements that were fabricated and installed in the museum, which could be rotated by the visitor. Um, and, uh, you know, when you first walk into space, it almost looks like it's empty, right? It's almost like, like, like as massive as these things are, and these things weigh thousands of pounds, each one, uh, it, it, because of the transparency, it, it felt like they're like almost like an empty gallery. But then as you interact with them, and here, let's go to the next slide. Um, as you interact with them, they start um, generating these often very surprising effects uh, through the reflection. So um, first of all, there was one specific configuration that if you hit it just right, the view through that window would bounce off of one element, bounce off of the other element, and you could actually, it actually bounced through the doorway and you could see it out from outside the gallery. You would see this view kind of like doing this billiard shot, right? Um, and then on the right, uh, the image on the right, you can see how like as you turn it, all sorts of like surprising effects would happen. The, the ceiling uh, with Pam's very distinctive sort of lights would appear and um, it would be very disorienting. So this is a piece that was just on one hand, like just super subtle, but just super dramatic at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you could see that the view is of the, the bridge just outside. So it was like watching a movie because you could see the cars moving through. Um, and this one really ties very closely to that, that sort of deep interest that I've talked about um, with respect to uh, visual perception and phenomenology and, um, and cognitive you, science. Repeating which artist this was from the last slide? The one before, Sarah Oppenheimer, New York based artist. Now, one thing that you don't see here, talk about like logistics. Um, we had to cut into the floor. Uh, oh. These things are very heavy. So, um, I, I'm such a nerd about these things, so forgive me if I'm boring you, but like we actually had um, uh, we had to like go under, it would go into the vents or our crew had to go into the vents and sort of tunnel through to the spot where those posts would come in and put these car jacks and then sort of bolster the floor and, you know, just the engineering complexities were just through the roof on that. It was just amazing. and. Sarah was incredible and our crew was just unbelievable and making this thing happen. And it was just one of those moments where you really think that, um, I mean, that's one of the things that art does. It shows you how, like think about Christo, for example, if we want to go to that last slide, um, Christo and Jean-Claude, um, the great sort of moral of their work and work like Sarah Oppenheimer is that you can be just a regular human being and make huge things happen with enough will, with enough determination, um, and um, and and through the help of collaborators. In the case of Christo, hundreds of collaborators, um, Christo and Jean Claude, um, uh, you can make change. Uh, you can make change on a large on a large scale, systemic level. That's amazingly inspirational. That's what art is, you know? Yeah. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's symbolic in a way of mm -hmm. that potential that we all have. And then, was this your last slide or? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want to give short thrift, shrift to uh, Dara. Dara is a, Dara Friedman is a Miami based artist and that was a show, she's uh, primarily a, She's an artist, but she works primarily in film and video. Um, and that was a survey, like a retrospective. But it was a retrospective of an artist who works in this medium that is in a way not really conducive to a chronological uh, presentation, right? Um, like uh, because of sound leak and light leak and things like that, uh, that, that show is such an interesting challenge um, to, to, to lay out and to be able to present um, this career, this beautiful, this, this career of just this artist's incredibly beautiful work, in my opinion, just uh, unbelievably beautiful work um, in a way that's cohesive. Uh, so just as a curatorial exercise, that was a really fascinating show um, to, for me. And, and again, just uh, involved this very intense relationship. Um, and um, I, I just can't tell you how privileged I feel to have had these experiences and these opportunities to 
do this for a living, to get to know these amazing individuals um, uh, deeply uh, over the course of years. Um, uh, if that, and, and that's what I do. So, I mean, it just goes back to what I said earlier about my earliest experiences at RISD. It was just the first moment that I started doing this work. I, it was just clear to me that this is possibly the only thing that I can do. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is there is there anything that you've been following lately that you would say might be up for, for the next exhibition? Um, do you have anything planned for the reopening and um, what is your, what, I guess, like, what is currently on your mind? Yeah, well, you know, in my, my new position, uh, in a way, like, the actual exhibition projects, uh, it, I wouldn't say it takes second, uh, a second role, but it kind of does. I mean, we mentioned in the introduction, I'm working on this big show of the work of uh, Gary Simmons, um, whose work I just love, uh, look it up. I mean, he's an incredible artist. Gary Simmons lives in LA. Um, and um, <clears throat> so I definitely have, you know, a lot of projects like that in mind and I have, uh, uh, you know, more immediate projects like uh, sort of uh, reconfiguring the collection galleries and things like that. But uh, as far as what's most imminent for the museum, uh, when we reopen, we will be presenting a show called Allied with Power African and African diasporic art from the collection of Jorge Perez, uh, which is a set of um, about 40 uh, promised gifts to the museum's collection from Jorge Perez, who's been obviously an, an amazing supporter um, of all uh, of um, African, and like I said, African and African diasporic artists from Africa, Europe, uh, Latin America, and uh, the United States. And it really presents this opportunity, particularly in the context of our collection eventually, uh, to um, make this really kind of powerful statement of solidarity uh, uh, across these national, um, you know, in ways that, that, that sort of transcend these national uh, cultural linguistic boundaries. It's being organized by our curator, Maria Elena Ortiz, uh, who I, I know you know and who's done just amazing work. Um, on the heels of that will be a show called My Body, My Rules, organized by our associate curator, Jennifer Ignacio, which deals with the female form and uh, feminist uh, kinds of ideas about reclaiming agency and reclaiming um, women's ability to uh, control uh, their bodies and the representation of their bodies. Um, so yeah, we have some really hard hitting stuff coming up. It's going to be really powerful. And um, at the same time, um, you know, uh, so much, so much beauty, uh, so much beauty. So um, I, I urge you all to come back when, when you're ready. Morning. We miss you. We miss you like crazy. We miss our audience and um, we are really, we can't wait to, to reopen and um, to be back amidst uh, the art. Well, I can promise the audience definitely misses you guys too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you. I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of your insight tonight. It was really a pleasure hearing how you approach these amazing shows and just the work and the thoughtfulness that goes into creating such a beautiful experience for the community and the community to come. And I really appreciate all, all the work you do and the time you took out today. And I would like to invite everyone who's on today to maybe unmute themselves and, and give a small round of applause <laughs> to, to thank you. I'm not sure actually <laughs> if we can do that in this. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you all for joining. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Renee. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, if I, could, if I may, let me just take uh, one more minute just to, to encourage everyone to support our local artistic ecosystem at this moment uh, in particular. You know, this is a moment where um, there is obviously a lot of need and, um, and, and uh, a lot of people are very deserving. So, you know, now that we're stuck in our homes staring at an empty wall, like consider going out there and buying a, a work by a local artist to help help keep things, um, help everyone survive and get through this. We're all in this together. Uh, so that's sort of my last pitch.
Absolutely. Yeah. We're all in this together. <laughs> okay.